and this is really launching onto my soapbox now that what's really amazing there's such resistance and there has been for years and years and years in higher education in departments of education around reading that whole language is still really deeply entrenched um, in in higher ed and it, it it just it really affects teachers coming out and and more importantly it affects kids in the classroom and the 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 reading issues are really adult driven issues because we really do know how to teach reading but we have to give it a lot more time we have to really rethink paradigms about how we teach reading in school um, i'm we're involved in consulting with some local schools and you know, really well-intentioned people, um, but they just, they're, they're operating um, f from a paradigm that, that is just, it's not based on any research. You say paradigm, you mean like that, like you hear like the 90 minute segment. Yeah, that's part of it. I think the biggest issue that I see, a good reading teacher, if they're well-trained, can take any curriculum <coughs> and make it work. Now there's some curriculum that's out there that's far superior to other curriculum, um, but you can't use curriculum as an excuse. Uh, you can make it work. But we're looking at how much time is devoted to reading, what's the curriculum that they're using, what's the teacher preparation to use that curriculum, what's the teacher preparation. And, you know, it's one thing to be prepared in a curriculum that itself doesn't present reading correctly. And all these basal readers out there, most of them um, I, wouldn't, I would never use with kids. But what's the teacher's preparation? What's their background knowledge and phonemic awareness? Take tonight, what you've learned tonight, and we can make courses that are one semester long in each of those strands. And then you need to have a course in assessment as well in that Ames Web stuff. Right and um, and most most of uh, uh, teacher pre preparation programs you have to have one introductory course in reading to get your elementary certificate and that's you're just not going to get what you need um, to be able to teach reading well and you know you need ongoing professional development but so you get that but the other really crucial piece is how do we group kids. You know, you have to have kids who, you have to have where they're breaking down. You need to create homogenous groups around phonemic awareness. You don't want to have a kid who's strong in phonemic awareness being sitting in a phonemic awareness group. What's going to happen to that kid? Oh, he's, you're going to, he's going to become a behavior problem. And when he gets to be a behavior problem, he's going to drag the other six kids down with him. So you have to have appropriate grouping across those five strands. And, you know, we believe, I believe, that multi-age grouping is okay. That if you have weak second graders in phonics and stronger first graders in phonics and they're in the same, you know, in that, in that same um, layer, then put them together. Be flexible the way we look at teaching reading across K through three. I think if we did that, we could deploy our resources, our human resources better and we get better results with kids. The other really, really important thing um, is, and it's, this is ex almost opposite of the way reading is taught in many places, is that we do not want, in these early, emerge, with these emerging readers, we really want to control text. So whatever that I'm introducing from a phonics standpoint, I want that to be represented in the connected text that they're reading. I do not want kids guessing at what words and they just see yeah, they know. see the initial sound and they see maybe another feature, an orthographic feature of the word later, and they, and they guess at it. And they're taught to use context to guess. And we know guessing is a really, really, really bad strategy for emerging readers. It's a terrible strategy. So control the text, give them direct explicit instruction, and they will read with good grouping. So then we get into policy. So long story short, because I've already held you late. Um, but uh, in 2007, uh, a reading task force was convened in Minnesota. And there were 12 of us. Um, there were 
eight uh, professors from higher education, um, a mother advocate, a mom who had two dyslexic kids, um, and myself, I was named to it, and then a couple of uh, neutral parties on the Minnesota Department of Education. Um, I took, um, we all broke down, there were six different licensing um, areas, and I took the, L, uh, the, the mom, and I took elementary, because we, we just feel so strongly that kids have to be prepared by the end of third grade. So we were on the elementary committee, and it was supposed to be a one-year commitment, and it was a battle royale with, um, with higher education, and it ended up being three um, three years and a hard fought, but we had, we, our, our, our responsibility was to look at the standards that teachers had to have uh, in reading in order uh, to get their licenses. And happily, there, was, there were 56 competencies, 56 standards for an elementary school teacher, um, and only one of them um, spoke of the five strands. So we went back and turned everything on its head and got where we need to be through a lot of, a lot of uh, politicking. We, we were involved in the legislature. We created a legislative law, uh, put a lot of pressure on higher education, grassroots pressure, and finally we got what we needed. Why was the government so resistant to allowing you what you needed? Um, th actually, the, the legislators, uh, the House and the Senate were very supportive, and we were able to pass the legislative bill. It took two years to do that. Um, but where the resistance was, was with higher education because they did not want a prescriptive uh, set of skills that teachers had to have. They wanted to have the freedom to teach the way they wanted to teach. And it really became uh, a philosophical difference. We were saying, we were very, very prescriptive. I wrote, um, it, it, was, it was very prescriptive, um, just pages of standards. Um, and they said, oh, we do all of this. Um, but they don't. And, and, and what went along with it, now teachers, um, when they come through, starting in the March of 2012, so this March, um, teachers, new teachers coming out of colleges of ed have to pass an assessment that's reflective of all these standard, this knowledge that we were talking about tonight in order to get their license. And right now they're going through, um, this is the other battle, what the cut score was going to be. So. Um, higher ed wanted the cut score at about 40 to 50 percent. And I'm saying, well, if my kid in high school gets a 50 percent, he fails. Um, so we, we were asking for a cut score of 80 percent, and I think we got a cut score of 70 percent. Um, but starting in March, if you don't pass it, you don't get your license. Now the problem, that was great. We had to fight for three years to get that. Um, but the issue now is that the union said, okay, we'll grant this for new teachers, but we're not, we're gonna grandfather existing teachers in. So now we have, so say a school hires, my daughter's school hired a third grade teacher and a fourth grade teacher this year. So you have two young teachers coming into a system that doesn't work, and it's gonna be really hard for these small minnows to swim up the current. Uh, it's, they're just gonna get overwhelmed, so until we get standards for existing teachers put in, um, then I think it's, we're not going to see a big impact in the classroom. Well, way to go, John. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, thanks. It didn't feel that good during it, though, boy. Right. Uh, You'll have a legacy. Had the bull, bull, bullseye was there. John, my, my original question was, where did you fall in as to, you know, were you two from a teaching board or independent organizations? Or? What's that? Where did you fall in? You said there was one parent advocate and it says three representing independent organizations. Yeah, I was the independent organization, okay. one of them. Yeah. Um, so just went through. So I, these are uh, everything I just talked about. Um, and then this is kind of a, a list of resources uh, that you could avail yourselves of that as really good good reading information. Now, we're, I'm going to give a talk, I think, in November, I think on November 17th, and Florida has gone through a really impressive reading reform. It was very draconian. It came from Jed Bush when he was um, the governor there, you know, very right-wing, uh, you know, very conservative governor, governor, but he said, you know, these kids need to learn to read, and um, they went through dramatic 
uh, reading reform and they're getting dramatic results. So I just met a couple weeks ago with one of the primary reformers um, in, in his administration. He, she was in charge of leading the reform. Uh, she came out to Minnesota to talk with us. And so we have sort of next steps that we're going to do here. Now, they, they were able to make reform throughout schools. So now we've only touched the new teachers. Uh, we want to touch all teachers, and she's sharing ideas.